My name is Sarwat, I'm the space editor at The National, and uh, this panel session is going to be about connecting with outer level. space. So basically, there's a lot happening with space, and we're wondering, what does it have to do with us? Our panelists will hopefully help answer that. Uh, let me welcome His Excellency Salim al Murray, Director General of the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center. Uh, you probably know the organization is responsible for a lot of the UAE's landmark missions, such as the UAE astronaut program, uh, Earth observation satellites, and also the Hope Mars mission uh, was done a lot by the Emirati engineers at the Space Center. Let me also welcome John Zernicki, who is the past president of the Royal Astronomical Society in the UK. John has just worked, I just want to highlight what John has done. So he's, he was not only the past president of the Royal Astronomical Society, but he has worked on several impressive projects, such as the Hubble Space Telescope and the probe that landed on Saturn's moon Titan in 2005. So well done. <laughs> um, I have a question to both of you. First with His Excellency. How does space exploration help us understand our own place in the universe? Yeah, good afternoon. Thank you, Sarawat. Uh, I think that's an important question. I think uh, all of us as, uh, you know, we're all explorers. We all have that explorer inside of us. When we're kids, we're exploring, we're finding out new things in the playground or wherever you are. And we as humans tend to be explorers. So if you look at our history, whether it's exploring the oceans, discovering the new world, whatever it is, we have that exploration gene or, if you like, uh, uh, trait in ourselves. So the next phase of exploration, the way I see it, is, you know, the unknown is pretty much in space. And, uh, you know, when you look at something like our solar system, uh, if you're going to send an object, you know, we were talking about this over lunch, uh, um, similar to Voyager, it'll take 40 years just to cross our solar system. However, there are hundreds of billions of stars and solar systems out there that potentially might have something. So for me, I mean, just that excitement towards uh, exploring outer space and trying to find out what's, what potentially could be there, that is really a big part of why space exploration is, is very important. Plus, of course, all the other side benefits of when you try to s explore space, you're doing something very hard, very difficult, and that very hard and difficult thing really upskills your capabilities, allows you to uh, really build unique uh, spacecraft to try and attempt those types of things. So these are two things that I think are really important for us to look at space exploration as something important for us as humans. We're seeing so much of the impact here in the UAE as well. I will get uh, speak more on that later. Uh, John? I'd like to continue the theme that you introduced of exploration and uh, perhaps bring up some specifics. So I can remember when I was a small child and first became interested in the sky and what was up there, it was actually before the space age. And thinking of that time, our ignorance in many respects was significant. For example, Mars, it was perfectly reasonable to, to expect that Mars might have vegetation on its surface. There could even be life on Mars. Turning to Venus, we didn't know the length of the day on Venus, and the surface of the planet Mercury was a complete mystery. Now, since the space age, we have either flown by or orbited or landed on every planet in the solar system, some of the moons of the planets, and some comets and asteroids. So, you know, the development in our understanding of our backyard, our solar system, has just been gigantic. And you mentioned, you know, I've been fortunate enough to be involved in several missions. Um, we flew by Halley's Comet in 1986, the first time we'd ever seen what was at the heart of a comet. And it is, in fact, 
just a lump of ice. We call it a dirty snowball from Halley's Comet, about 15 kilometers in size only. And that produces, when it gets near the sun, this beautiful tail that we see for a comet. And then we landed on the surface of Titan, Saturn's largest moon. And these are now places that I personally feel that I know. I know better than some places here on Earth. So, you know, following the theme of this forum, I think we're so much better connected with our, our cosmic neighborhood. That's a good point. And I think um, what would be interesting for the audience to know as well is you are doing so much in space, uh, Your Excellency. Uh, what way, in what ways do you think the country's efforts in space can help everyday people in the Emirates and in the region? Yeah, I mean, um, we use space technology every single day of our lives. And, uh, you know, this is something that I talk about a lot. And, you know, most of the people here uh, have used space technology today, maybe without knowing or, you know, consciously, but it's become so, uh, so much part of our life that you don't even know that you're using it. So whether it's navigation signals coming from GPS satellites, whether it's, you know, communication signals, whether it's TV signals, whether it's Earth observation data, weather data, you know, is it raining? It might rain soon, I, I just saw that. So that's probably come from a satellite. Uh, if we want to find out things about our planet, the changes that are happening on our planet, you know, if we go with the theme of COP uh, being hosted uh, in Dubai, in the UAE, uh, a lot of the data that tells us that, you know, uh, our planet's in danger comes from satellite data. So. Uh, today, the space technology has become so uh, intertwined in our lives that we, I think it'd be very, we'd be living a very different life without space technology. And of course, there are the, ele uh, the other elements of, you know, maybe what people associate space technology with. And, you know, if they, if they that, you know, you hear sometimes uh, negative elements of, you know, is this really what we should be spending our money on rather than spending money on the ground? And those tend to be maybe towards some of the scientific missions and human spaceflight. And again, I bring the same thing back to the first topic that I spoke about. Uh, if we go with human spaceflight, we have an astronaut in orbit right now. And the amount of inspiration that that brings to the country, to the region, uh, uh, you know, you, uh, I think it's a very good deal at the end of the day. You know, the, uh, you, you're not going to be able to inspire this many kids and adults uh, any other way. So th that's the way I would look at it. Also, uh, the amount of learning that goes through there, the amount of technology that we have to develop and and even the operational skills of just managing humans in space in such a difficult environment, we learn a lot about how to live a better life here on Earth. Uh, and it's all about, again, you know, conserving energy, conserving water, uh, living a, 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 a lifestyle that's balanced. And if we do that on Earth, then that will solve a lot of our problems. So I think space does show us how we can uh, better use to utilize our planet. And believe me, from you know, monitoring people that are living in space, we don't want to destroy our planet to a point where we have to live in space because it's not as comfortable as it is here on our planet. So I think in all senses, you know, uh, space is important. And whether you're talking about somebody who's a three-year-old, you know, I have a four-year-old and she loves space, up to people that are in their 60s and 70s, what the UAE is doing in space really can help all of them somehow in some way. And that's why we're investing that much. And now it's not only the UAE, we're looking at the region. So I think what the UAE has done over the past 20 years has kind of brought big attention to how space can be a benefit to the people as well as the economy, that now countries of the region have started really st uh, investing in space. And I'm not going to say following the UAE, but at least looking at what the UAE has done and seeing how they can do something similar. And an example of that is that Saudi Arabia is launching two astronauts in two days. Uh, and Sultan Niyadi has been in the space station for three months. So you can see that today, this is important for us and for the region. Just adding on that, it, there is the first Saudi woman launching to the space station this weekend, if that goes through, hopefully. Um, and John, how, is, how has space exploration over the years helped develop technologies on Earth? And what can be done to inspire more innovation? That's a heavy question. Well, I think many people in answering this question would refer to specific technologies or products, you know, like the, 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 the usual thing is Teflon and nonstick frying pans and Velcro and things like that. That's not the way I would approach it. Um, 
space is an incredibly unforgiving and challenging environment, or at least it can be. When something goes wrong, you can't go up there with your screwdriver or your soldering iron, you know, to fix things. Well, if you're on the space station, you can, but generally with the satellites that we deal with, you can't do that. So how, you know, most satellites, most space missions do work. I mean, the statistics are remarkably good. So why is it that, that it is like that? I would put it down to two things. It's, it's good design, and the second is testing, testing, testing. Um, space research, I mean, generally seems quite exotic, doesn't it? But actually, a lot of it is very boring. You know, the, the testing, for example, the amount of time and attention to detail um, is just enormous. And the reason we do that, of course, is that if you're going to have a failure, have the failure on the ground, not in space. So we test for every conceivable sort of environment, the hard vacuum of space, the extreme temperatures, radiation, the vibration of launch, all of these you, you simulate as much as you can and you try and test for every possible um, scenario that might crop up. And the other thing is a good design and that involves redundancy, for example, wherever possible. And so all of these, this sort of philosophy of, of how you approach design and testing. I mean, this does feed through, I think, in, in engineering, in particularly big engineering projects here on, on, on the ground. So there is that, that synergy. Uh, and that's, that's one of the great benefits, I think, of space research. I think His Excellency would have a great example on that, um, especially how MBZ sat satellite is being developed. Um, you're working with private companies here, especially the aluminum company, and then Falcon, is it Falcon Group that's developing some hardware, but it wasn't an airspace company, never worked on satellites, but now it is. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I mean, that's uh, definitely, I agree with what uh, Professor John just mentioned, uh, you know, testing, 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 and, you know, for us now, our latest satellite that we're building uh, here in the UAE is called uh, MBZSAT, it's named after the UAE president. Uh, we started that program at least five years ago, six years ago. So you can see, building it's about one ton system, so it's quite a large satellite, uh, but it's uh, uh, taking five or six years to develop. It will be, you know, it's been tested for uh, the past three years. We actually don't build one satellite, we build three or four different models. And we put those models through very rigorous testing for months on end. So as uh, Professor John said, we don't want the failure to happen in space. We, we want it to happen on the ground. So we test and test and, and push it to its limits so that it fails, which it does. And then we go and fix that failure so that in space that doesn't happen. Now, the nice thing about MBZSAT is that it's a fully uh, Emirati designed satellite built at the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center. We have about 250 uh, staff who are working on that or who work at the center that are part of that program. But the nice thing about this one is that now we have, we're developing an ecosystem. Uh, it's not us who developed it, we're, we are utilizing that ecosystem. But today, all of the panels or the, uh, the structure of the satellite is developed in UAE industry in Alain and Strata, uh, some of it in Jebel Ali. All of the electronics, a lot of them are built in Abu Dhabi. And a lot of the harness and cabling is done in uh, Dubai as well. So uh, with private industry, private companies. So that wasn't something that we thought would be uh, viable a couple of years ago, before we would design, either build in-house or procure everything outside. Even the aluminium itself, all of the aluminium in the satellite is coming from EGA, and it's an it's a eco-friendly aluminium that was uh, created through solar power. So it's, uh, you know, there's that, um, let's say, environmental aspect linked to it. So today, I think us having this ecosystem of existing industry that's able to twist or tweak themselves, after about five years, to be able to get their technology in space, I think that's uh, pretty cool. And that's really one of our big objectives is that we want industry in the UAE to be involved. I think that ties in well with my next question, which is how MBRC has used collaboration instead of competing with other agencies or companies, for example, to make its missions possible. You know, having succeeded in so many missions in such a short period of time. 
Yeah, I think collaboration is key, and uh, space is like that anyway. So when you look at space, uh, you know, it did start out with the space race, but if you'll talk to Professor John or any other person in space, they'll tell you they've been probably traveled all over the world and worked with 20 different nationalities. So because it's quite small industries in each country, and, and you know, it's, it's looked at as we as humans uh, looking out to the stars. So we work together to try and discover what's ha you know, what's, what we don't know, what's, what's out there. When astronauts go to space, they look at it as six humans, not a Russian, Emirati, a UAE or whatever, six humans against space. So it's them against space, surviving in space and thriving and working in space. So I think it's just that, that general element really brings that collaborative effort. We at MBRC, you know, we started close to 20 years ago, so not too long ago. And our first objective was to build satellites. And we launched a satellite called DubaiSat1, DubaiSat2, and it was on a knowledge and technology transfer program with South Korea. And that was kind of when we kicked off. So we went there to learn. We sent a very large team there. They took a lot of knowledge. Uh, I was one of those teams, so I was one of the, the first members of that team. I spent quite a lot of time in South Korea. I took too much knowledge. My wife is Korean, so that's another type of uh, knowledge transfer, but it, it works anyways. Either for MBRC it worked, and for me it worked. But <laughs> the point being that uh, uh, from that knowledge transfer, we came back and we, we took that same culture. And when we work today, today we work with at least 30 different countries. Uh, we are either gaining knowledge or we are doing it jointly where we have something to contribute and the other country has something to contribute or we are giving to smaller countries and ways for them to develop. And I'll give an example of each. I don't want to take too much time. So uh, today, for example, Sultan's in the space station. You know, we have an astronaut that we've uh, selected, prepared, and who's been training for three, four, or five years. He is now on a space mission. He's conducted a spacewalk. He is... Uh, you know, his situation is that of a US OS astronaut. So today, I look at that as very collaborative. We wouldn't be able to do that on our own, but today the UAE has an individual and an operations team and about 100 people behind this mission, as well as all the science and what we're doing there, that then brings a benefit to the ISS program. So I think that's very collaborative. Uh, another example is, you know, when we're looking at countries like Mauritius, Bahrain, Nepal, we have a system where we build small satellites about 6U or 12U, so they're, they're about 10 kilograms, we can say. And those satellites, we allow, we, we give these countries uh, uh, free space to launch their payloads into space, so it's access to space. So today, from a country that didn't have much in space 20 years ago and couldn't build anything in space, to a country where we are now supporting other countries that were in a similar situation to get to space. So I think it's all about the culture and how to collaborate, because that's how we grow in the space industry. If, if I could just add a brief comment to, to the Director General's comments, I could say that in my career in space research, certainly in space science, it is a remarkably open field. And um, one of the great pleasures for me, apart from going to exotic places like Halley's Comet and so on, it has been the collaboration with many different countries, cultures, and so on. So within Europe, for example, our, within the European Space Agency, almost all, all of our projects are across the board. So if I'm putting an instrument together, I'll be working with a team of software engineers from Finland, mechanical engineers from Italy, um, you know, the electronics will come from Spain. It's, it, you know, there are challenges sometimes, but in the end, it, it is one of the great pleasures to be able to work like this towards that common goal. Um, it's and I want to touch on the Hubble Space Telescope, since you're talking about a common goal. Um, what makes it unique, and how have the discoveries so far taught us about our own planet and the solar system? Okay, well, I mean, the first thing to say, and, and probably most people won't know this, but initially Hubble was a complete disaster, really. It was hopelessly over budget, it was hopelessly late, and when it was finally launched in 1990, the beautifully polished mirror was, was made to the wrong shape. So basically, you know, the images that came down were blurred. Um, you know, the story of the repair and so on is, is, is one of the wonders of, of space research. And it's been working for, what, more than 30 years now. Um, it was the first large telescope in, in space, beyond the, the uh, 
surface of the Earth. Now, why put a telescope in space? We can build much cheaper and more easily big telescopes on the ground. But the, the, even in the visible part of the spectrum, where obviously light passes through the atmosphere, it's degraded by the atmosphere. You know, the atmosphere blurs the light. So by putting it above the atmosphere, just really a few hundred kilometers above our heads, you know, Hubble is sometimes closer to us here than my home uh, town of Oxford in England. You know, it's just up there below Earth orbit. And apart from removing the effect of the atmosphere, also in orbit, there's no rain, there's no clouds, nothing in theory to um, limit its, its observations. It was also, I think, the first large uh, facility in space to be designed from the start to be, to be serviced by the space shuttle, by astronauts. So it was planned from the very start that as technology evolved, you could go up with the astronauts on the shuttle, remove an element, and place a new one in there. So what we designed in Europe, because another thing I should say, and this often gets forgotten, Hubble is from the very start 15 to 20 percent European. And we built in Europe the camera, faint object camera, which operated for 12 years. It held the record, maybe still does, for the longest serving camera in space. And, uh, but actually that was, even when we launched it, it was old technology. So after 12 years, it was replaced by a more modern camera. Um, you asked what, what has it, uh, you know, what has Hubble contributed? Well, there's no branch of astronomy or space research, really, where Hubble hasn't contributed. Uh, I'll very quickly refer to two things which always stick in my mind. There's an image called the Hubble Deep Field. So they specifically chose the most boring part of the sky, where there's ostensibly nothing. And basically, Hubble stared at it for a total of about 10 days. And the images, you can see about, I can't remember the exact number, but it's about 10,000 galaxies in this apparently boring bit of the sky. I mean, it's just overwhelming, you know, how um, the universe is just teeming with galaxies and everything that galaxies contain. The second thing is exoplanets. So when Hubble was launched in 1990, the term exoplanet was something in our imagination. So an exoplanet is a planet orbiting another star other than our sun. We thought these might exist, but nobody had seen them. Then in 1995, the first one was discovered. I checked up a few days ago. The latest list has about five and a half thousand exoplanets. It means they are everywhere. Probably, perhaps every star has planets going around it. And what Hubble has done, it's not so much discovering them, but it studies a few of them in great detail. And it's now able to look at the atmospheres of these exoplanets. And perhaps even one of these days, it might be able to see signs of biological activity, i.e. signpost the presence of life on, on one of these distant exoplanets. So my question this morning about life elsewhere in the universe wasn't completely crazy, you know. We really might discover it. We believe you. Um, and I want to touch on the challenges a bit now. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about how space benefits life on Earth. Uh, but when it comes to Nascent space, nascent space program, so, you know, emerging space nations. What kind of challenges do you think they face and how do you think they can be overcome? Your Excellency. Uh, yeah, I think uh, it's a good question. Um, I can, maybe I can give examples from uh, what I've seen without naming countries, but I think maybe the number one thing that uh, uh, or challenges that they face is once a, a, a small country has invested in space or started to take those first steps into space, um, it tends to stop after that. Or, you know, they've achieved what they've wanted, they've become a spacefaring nation somehow, 
they've sent an astronaut, uh, they've sent a satellite up, and then what I've seen is a lot of countries, especially the, the new ones, tend to uh, see that it's quite a significant investment, and you know the political system maybe changes, or the people that were supporting it, certain ministers, etc., change, and then so I think continuity is probably one of the biggest challenges that especially new countries coming into the space field uh, would face. So they ha there has to be the strong political will, uh, a strong push uh, from the government to continue for a sustained period of time. Uh, and then once they've settled and industry starts getting involved and there's this, uh, you know, multiple entities in the country and the benefits are very clear, then I think it can go on. So I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges that they face. Another one is uh, one that we faced is when you start saying, okay, I'm going to build a satellite and I'm going to, you know, do whatever you want to do. I'm going to build a probe to Mars. I'm going to send a rover to the moon. Who's going to do it? And, you know, how do you build these people? You know, where, where, where did these people come from? So it's about training. We took about 10 years of training in Korea to build a core team of about 100 people who then can then come in and then start training others and build from there. So I think that requires a lot of patience and being able to get the right people, the staff. So as a small country, anybody here knows that, of course, getting the right graduates and the, the trained graduates and then keeping them with you for 20 years is a big challenge. I think other small countries as well, you know, why would I go to a very new industry that is very risky when I can go to a teleco or, you know, a very well-established uh, industry if I'm an engineer? So in my opinion, these are two of the biggest challenges they would face. Third one, of course, is depending on the country, you might face a lot of uh, export restrictions, uh, uh, some, uh, you know, knowledge transfer restrictions. Some countries are open with some countries, some countries are closed. So space can be very political. Uh, it can be, you know, sometimes it's cutting edge technology, sometimes it's very old, but it's very controlled technology. And when you have, you know, access to space with rockets and dual use technology, the, the, these can make things quite sensitive in the space field. So I think these three are what I would say are the biggest challenges. And how do you think these countries can overcome these obstacles? I mean, we're seeing some countries announcing long-term space programs now in the region. Yeah, well, I think today, if we talk about today, it's, it's becoming easier. So first of all, access to space now when you've got somebody like Elon Musk and you've got SpaceX, that was always the, the factor that would cause an issue. I mean, I'm sure uh, uh, Professor John here would tell us, you know, the launch was a major factor. First of all, there weren't that many rockets launching, and then the cost of them was was a big chunk of uh, the, the mission itself. That's why you'd get one mission with 30 different sensors on it or 30 different cameras. Today, launch, you know, uh, SpaceX are launching and Electron and others are launching a rocket every couple of days. So your satellite can have one system on it. It can be small. It can be cheap. It can be... So now it's easier. Uh, I think that's uh, one element, but I think that the, the vision from the uh, political leadership is number one. I think you need that support top level if you're going to go really deep into space. And when I mean deep, I talk about, I'm talking about human space flight and I'm talking about space exploration. Forget about Earth observation, weather satellites, communication satellites. Those can be monetized and those can be done through commercial. But if you're talking about, I want to send something to the moon, I want to send something to a, to a distant planet, that tends to be governments doing it. Uh, human spaceflight tends to be governments, and you really need that political support. Uh, you need the academic sector involved, and you, uh, you know th that's what I think is uh, uh, are the main things for them. And I think my last question to John before we move on to a Q and A, and I'm expecting some interesting questions. This is we're talking about space. I mean, we have the DG of the Space Center here who can pretty much tell us anything about the astronaut in space right now. Um, John, companies are now trying to build infrastructure in low Earth orbit. What kind of challenges do you think commercializing LEO can create, especially in terms of regulations, and how can governments and the science community benefit from it? Okay, well, I, I warn you I'm going to be very slightly negative here. I'm wearing my hat as a scientist rather than as a regular citizen. Um, you know, I regard the dark sky as pretty much a human right. And there is a danger, you see, with the potential present and future mega constellations, we're talking about thousands 
or even tens of thousands of satellites. I mean, a real step change. And just imagine, so at the moment, we in Europe, we're building in Chile, high in the Andes, the world's largest telescope. It's called the, very imaginatively, the extremely large telescope. It's going to be, it, it's about 700 mirrors which combine essentially into a single telescope. It'll be about the size of a football field in terms of aperture, collecting area. So that's being built right now. It's a big project. So imagine at first light, when, when it's all up and working in around 2027, we switch it on and we look at the fabulous new images and all we see are streaks of tracks of the Elon Musk or other people's satellites um, shooting across the sky. And, and you know, when you go out here to look at the night sky, instead of seeing, I don't know, Cassiopeia and so on, the beautiful constellations, you'll see these satellites streaking across the sky. So, you know, that's one problem. The other problem is collisions. If we really do have tens of thousands in low Earth orbit, and you know, there is a doomsday scenario where there's a runaway effect where one satellite collides with another, produces a vast amount of space debris. Each bit of space debris is then potentially able to crash into another satellite, and you can have a runaway effect, which could, in the worst case, make low Earth orbit essentially unusable. So, you know, these, these are both real, real challenges, one scientifically and that, the other practically. And I guess the answer is regulation. You know, this, this can't be the Wild West. There has to be regulation to um, regulate the, the type of satellites. that You can do perhaps small design changes to reduce the amount of reflected light off the satellites, because that's why we see them, it's reflected sunlight. Um, and by changing materials, you can at least reduce that. Uh, so, so, so regulation. Now, as far as benefits, um, well, actually, I would argue that it's science which is one of the greatest beneficiaries of the ability to to transfer information, ideas, and and data. So, you know, any um, mega constellation which would provide improved communication and the ability to transfer data because that's what we want to do you know perhaps uniquely in 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 science what we want to do once we've made a measurement or made discoveries is not to monetize it but actually to tell the whole world you know to publish it and to to spread the word because that's how we're judged essentially by our ability to make measurements to make discoveries and to spread the word so any sort of connectivity, to again use the buzzword of today, is good for us. Good for us. Yeah, we could have also talking about, uh, talked about the commercial space stations that so many companies are trying to build, but we're, run we're running out of time. So I'm going to open the floor to questions. I think we have a lady right here in the middle. Um, uh, so I'd, uh, I'd ask my question. I'm not sure whether you 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 uh, you already spoke about it or answered it or not. But I was just trying to connect this session to the earlier sessions where we spoke about climate, and um, I was wondering. Uh, I would I would like to hear more about your thoughts about um, space waste and uh, the future of that. And uh, is it something you worry about? Is it th something we should be? You know, just more thoughts on that and. Um, um, the future of this, really, with all, with all that you've been discussing. Sorry, thoughts on uh, waste, fut uh, space waste, space debris. Uh, yeah, yeah, and waste and debris, space debris. Um, and who are you addressing that question to? Uh, my name is. Ha Sorry, both, both actually. So, if any of you would like to take that question first, your thoughts on space debris. So, so the question is, is, are we worried about space debris? Right, yeah. and the future yeah. of that. Um, absolutely, we are. Um, I mean, over my career, I, I've seen a, a, a significant change. We were, in a way, slightly cavalier, perhaps in the earlier days of space research. I mean, 
uh, I wasn't responsible for much debris, but a little bit. You know, for example, if you fly a camera or a telescope or something like that, when it's on the ground or on the launch pad, you have a, a cover, like a lens cap, you know, to protect it from dust and dirt and so on. And then once you get into space, you have explosive bolts which throw the, the cover off. So in the old days, you would just throw it away and it would go into orbit, it would become a piece of space junk. These days, you can't do that. You, it's tethered, it's attached in such a way that it won't, won't escape. So my point in saying that is that there is now regulation. Um, I don't know quite how legally binding it all is, but essentially all spacefaring nations have signed up to protocols of, of good practice. And, and also, when uh, a, a, a spacecraft or a, a motor is finished, has done its job, you have to consider essentially how to get rid of it in a responsible way. So, um, to answer the question, yeah, I mean, I think we are all worried and concerned because you can have potential catastrophes, um, but we now we, we behave much more responsibly. Do you think there needs to be a law, a global law, for co space agencies and companies to have the technology in their spacecraft? Don't, don't, don't ask me questions about legalities. <laughs> I mean, it's a minefield. Um, yeah, of course, there should be, but uh, how you implement any of this, goodness knows. Any more questions? Gentleman in the front. Oh, um, I think we'll take, we'll take you next. Hi. Um, how soon might we see astronauts living on the moon or even Mars? And may they be Emirati? Yeah, thanks for your question. I think uh, um, the moon is something that's happening, definitely. So if we look at uh, the global plans uh, with, the, uh, with the Artemis program uh, that's already been launched, you know, they've already selected four astronauts that are going to orbit the moon uh, next year or the year after. Uh, the U.S. and the global partners are planning to go back to the moon in a very sustainable way. So rather than the Apollo kind of top-down approach where you go very heavy and come back pretty much with nothing, and then you have to build everything else again, so it's very expensive. Uh, now they're trying to do it in a way where there's a station orbiting the moon, and then astronauts will go to that station, similar to they go to the space station, and then land on the surface of the moon. So I personally see from the plans that I've seen and what, what, what I know about the industry that we will probably see humans landing on the surface of the moon within this decade. So that'll be quite an exciting thing. And that hasn't happened uh, for the, uh, more than 50 years. So I think that's going to be a, a program that would be very, you know, uh, at least a, a unique program for this, uh, at least the next 50 years or for this century at least, similar to how it was for uh, last century. Now, in terms of Mars, there are plans to say that when you have a sustainable presence around the moon, you can use that as a springboard to get to Mars, but Mars is much harder. It's much further away. So getting to the moon directly will be three, four days. Uh, you know, again, you know, it's people traveling in very tight, confined spaces. It's not easy, right? Imagine going to Mars, and it takes you nine months. And then you know, it'll take you nine months to get back. And you can't come back immediately. You know, you've got to spend a couple of years there. So it's a three-year journey, and the communication between Mars and Earth is 20-minute delay. So even if you want to say hi to Professor John, you've got to wait 20 minutes for his hi back or 40 minutes for the signal to go back and forth. So much, much harder. But I think that'll happen, in my opinion, uh, the late 2030s or sometime in the 2040s if investments within the Artemis program go as they are and the political will, as we were talking before, and the, the, the desire is pushed by all of these countries. But let's keep one thing in mind. This is a global program. So it's happening pretty much with a lot of countries. So it's not as the Apollo program, which was pretty much US-led and cent centered, and with small participation from other countries. Um, the lady at the front. Uh, this question is for His Excellency. So the UAE has really revived the legacy of Arabs leading in astronomy. And I just wanted to know what interest you're receiving or seeing from other Arab countries, particularly those outside the GCC. Thank you for your question. Uh, do you mean interest in terms of uh, the projects we're doing, et cetera, and all those elements, or what type of interest? So what's the current of the UAE, and particularly enter the space program? 
Yeah, I, I, I mean, uh, honestly, I see that growing every single day. I mean, I see it day by day growing. Um, again, you know, if we look at the way things start, there is some skepticism in the Arab world. So, you know, when you launched projects, you know, 15 years ago, did you build that? You know, this is something you bought, you know, that's, uh, these were the kind of things that we'd hear a lot of. Uh, today, when you see people like Sarwat coming over to the center, doing a tour, seeing things being built, publicizing that, uh, we get tours from Arab schools, we get tours from global schools coming, and you know they can't believe that this is being done in the region. Uh, that narrative or that, that idea changes, and then the, the, the thoughts start, you know, how can I do this in my country, or how can I be part of that? And I see that happening a lot with countries like Bahrain, uh, Kuwait as well. We've supported these countries in trying to set up programs with universities. We're working locally in universities here. We've had uh, delegations from Jordan, from Egypt, from all over the Arab world. Uh, and if we look at things like human space flight, at the beginning, you know, the, the, again, the narrative is, why are we doing that? What's the point? Is this real? Is this fake? You know, these are the, the let's say, a lot of the thoughts that are coming from the Arab world itself. But today, when I see us doing things, uh, you know, it's 95% positive. People are looking at, wow, I'm learning every day what Sultan and Niyadi is doing. You know, every day we release a tweet from Sultan, whether it's a science tweet, whether it's an image of an Arab country or a local country, whether it's him, you know, taking, uh, you know, how do you clean your teeth in space, which will be today, you'll see it soon. And, you know, how do you eat in space? And uh, what we see is that there's many different age groups and they're all learning that, you know, actually it's really difficult to live in space and people going there and doing that is something very unique. Why don't we do this? Uh, with the spacewalk, we saw a lot of interest uh, from the Arab world. So just one small example, we recently tweeted uh, uh, an image of uh, Baghdad uh, and it, you know, it got millions of views, uh, millions of comments from people. And a lot of the comments are, you know, you know we hope that we can do that because uh, the, the, the tweet was that Baghdad was uh, part of the, the development of science, you know, uh, uh, a thousand years ago, or whatever it may be. And you know, they want to come back to that and be part of that. So a little bit of what the UAE is doing is bringing science and technology and innovation back to this region. So I see it takes time for it to grow, but every day I see it better and better. When I started uh, becoming interested, space was, as somebody I think referred to earlier, was really the a battlefield, if you like, between the USA and the Soviet Union, and, and really there weren't other serious players. Then gradually over time, as, as I started to be involved, Europe, through the European Space Agency, became a serious player, and Japan and then China. And so really the, 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 the picture can change and does change and, and will continue to do so. Thank you. Any more questions? If we have parents in here, you can ask, what can my kid do to become an astronaut? I think that's probably the most common question. Oh, right there. Hi, well, it's, um, hello. Um, John, in the morning, you asked a question that was, um, th there were two questions. One was, what would we do if an asteroid was coming towards the Earth? which you have not answered, which is what I'm asking now, what do we do? Because you've answered the second part of the question, which is the alien life, and we've said, yes, we believe you. So what are we prepared if there's an asteroid hurling towards the Earth? Thank you. They're all worried now, John. You've got you to tell them. <laughs> um, are we prepared? I mean, in, in my view, it, it's, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. You know, the, if you look at... The s certain bodies in the solar system, the moon or Mercury, you know, bodies that don't have an atmosphere, don't have um, tectonic activity, which tends to, you know, smooth out um, signs of impacts. The moon and Mercury are just covered with impact craters. So, you know, the, the solar system is actually quite a violent place where these impacts can occur. So an another one will happen Will it be tomorrow or will it be in 50,000 years? That's what we don't know. Um, so I don't want to scare you, but you know, there is hope on the horizon. A um, couple of years ago, NASA had the first attempt at uh, something very crude in a way, which was smashing a spacecraft into the surface of an asteroid. It was called the, the DART mission. And so that happened 
And we have been able, with uh, you know, sophisticated ground-based telescopes, actually to measure the deflection of the asteroid. So its orbit was changed minutely. But the point is, if you have enough warning, i.e. 10 years or something like that, you only need to deflect the asteroid by a relatively small amount, you know, change its speed by centimeters per second, and you can deflect it enough so that it'll miss the Earth. So, uh, and in fact, ESA, the European Space Agency, is building a craft right now to go to this very asteroid that, that NASA impacted to look close up, to, to better understand, you know, the impact process so that, you know, we can understand these objects better and, and you know, should the worst happen, we would be in a good position. Um, what I would like to see, actually, is to have... Um, a set of satellites sitting somewhere in, in, in warehouses ready to go. You know, for me, it's just sensible insurance. And, you know, if you're talking about the destruction of all life on Earth, it's not a big price to pay. Satellite army, we got to think about that. Um, any more questions? We have a couple of minutes left. Um, okay, Th I want to thank the panelists for joining us today and for enlightening us with this wonderful conversation. Thank you.